Good afternoon and welcome to Stuck Together, Stuck Apart, where today we're going to explore a Bowen theory view of racism, toward a Bowen theory view of racism. I'm Eric Thompson. I'm the executive director of the Vermont Center for Family Studies. Everybody wave if you cannot hear me. Okay, we're good. The Vermont Center for Family Studies exists to strengthen families. And today we're going to be looking at the family of America. And what does Bowen theory have to offer us in this time now where we're all thinking, or so many of us about racism and trying to think clearly and trying to think systems about it. <clears throat> well, I was, uh, I had trepidation about doing this. I was more confident with Walter on here with me, Walter Smith, but um, I decided to go for it. And I wanna share, you, uh, share with you one of the things that motivated me to go ahead and go for it, which is a text exchange I had with Walter. <clears throat> in which I said, Walter, I feel like a dork on racism. And Walter responded, we're all in the eighth grade on racism and we don't deserve to graduate. Very warm response from Roger, I mean, from Walter. He also said in, in uh, the exchange, you got to get calm about racism to really see it and learn something new. So I'm on a journey to get calm about racism and learn something new. And I thought, you know, we can do this because it's just like in our training program when somebody presents a case. What we do there is um, try to create an environment where people are not trying to fix the problem, but trying to understand it. And that's really kind of magical when you get a, a group of people together who are trained in Bowen theory, um, working to just how do I understand this phenomenon from a Bowen theory perspective. So on onward ho. <clears throat> I'm going to um, talk, I'm, this is going to be, um, I'm going to give you a talk. I prepared a talk for you. It's about 25 minutes. It's about uh, 18 slides. About half the slides are quotes from Walter Smith um, from the email exchange that we had last week. I'm assuming most of you have watched Walter's uh, presentation last week. And um, so that's available if you haven't, but um, most of these quotes are gonna be new because they're from the email exchange that he and I have had. And um, then we're gonna do the breakout 10 minutes, give people a chance to uh, integrate and think out loud, and then come back and have uh, more interaction. And I'm gonna touch on two particular areas of Bowen theory regarding racism, the family projection process, which Walter Smith put a lot of emphasis on yes, uh, last week, and um, societal emotional process. So I hope you enjoy this ride through some of my thinking. I'm gonna start by some baseline, you know, some basic um, ideas that I hold in my head about Bowen theory that uh, are just foundational for me and I'm trying to see how do they fit with this question of racism. <clears throat> oh, by the way, just the last thing, Walter, it took me a long time to calm down about an intense system, symptom. So it's okay if this takes time. So this is a slide that I regularly use in my leadership development course for executives and people who lead organizations. If a king, and it's an ancient quote, it's thousands and thousands of years old, and I think it speaks to Bowen theory. Master self first. If a king attempts to master his ministers without first mastering himself, he will fail helplessly. 
the master of neither self nor ministers. But if first of all, he conquers the self as though it were a country, his attempts to master his ministers and his enemies will not be in vain. I love the size of the metaphor, as though it were a country. It's that big. And I put Martin Luther King on this slide for my clients because I just believe that Martin Luther King was probably the historical figure in America that I know about who best embodied this quote. And um, perhaps the most spiritual of our kind of founding fathers group that are memorialized in DC on the mall. And also perhaps the one who best expresses differentiation of self. And here's another slide that I've often used. A particular kind of triangle, many of you are very familiar with this and Bowen's writing about it. Here's how I think of it, <clears throat> that in an anxious, in a chronically anxious field, a chronically anxious relationship field, many types of distortions can be identified. And this is a very common type of distortion of an anxious field, that there's intensity among three people or say 100 people, and people jockey for the two inside positions at the bottom. They want to either be in the hero spot or the victim spot. And the way they do it is to join together and assert that another figure in the group is a villain. So with race in America, you can see that African Americans could occupy any one of these spots in this distorted perception field. Certainly they have occupied the villain spot many times. Um, you can see it in movies. When the store owner in Minneapolis called the police, he saw them, he saw him that way and he saw the police as, as the hero who would come help them. So, Bystanders like me want to align with the victim and revile the villain and join the hero club. But to see beyond the symptom, one has to find a way outside of these perception fields because the way I've thought about it, if you look into the details, take this to the level of a family, your own family, what you find is that these simple categories don't really work that well. If you do long-term work with child abuse like Walter did or domestic violence like Amy Post and Doug Murphy have done or self-injury like I did, you find that people really don't fit into these neat categories. Everybody has elements of all three. So that's a puzzle I bring to this question of racism. I think I have a lot of, uh, I, have, I have a sort of instant, I'd call it an instinct. If someone starts proclaiming that someone is a villain, that I, I, I sort of step back mentally and I watch and I try to see beyond the triangle. So that can be a challenge now, you know, in this situation where I sometimes have an instinct to want to defend the police. I've known a lot of cops, good ones. So I'm wondering if I'm holding this step back structure a little too tightly in order to think really well about racism, because certainly there is an objective version of this triangle. Though most of them are distorted, there is an objective version. There's a reality to this. This is another slide that's in the course I give for executives that um, I just want to touch that I think Rosa Parks, again, one of the historic, I, I cannot think of a historical figure that better represents the operationalizing of differentiation of self with the I position, defining what she would do and what she would not do, where she would sit, where she would not sit, 
and along with the support of the social system that Martin Luther King helped inspire, a specific, pre a, a specific absence of a preoccupation with getting someone else to change. I'm gonna change what I do and I'm gonna to work to not be placing all my bets on an anxious, pressured effort to get someone else to change. And we celebrate that incredible wisdom that she embodied. So what I've been thinking about is, have I gone too far in some ways in my valuing of this principle? When I have reaction, reaction sometimes to angry activists like the girl who spoke at my daughter's high school graduation last week, I can, I can stiffen around that kind of language and think to myself, I wish I could talk to you about eye positions. Now I'm kind of wondering, is that my, is that the way undifferentiation plays out in me? That I get that stiffening. <clears throat> and then I just wanted to share this thought. It just, after these, exchanges with Walter, I was thinking about it. So thinking about sy symptoms and diagnosis. So I have a long history of having people come to me and say, well, you know, my father is a narcissist, don't you? Oh, uh, well, you know, she's just a borderline, Eric. I've heard these phrases throughout my professional career as a psychologist and now as a leadership development coach. And um, like many of you trained in Bowen theory, I learned to recognize that as individual thinking that collapses the larger reality into a narrow version that's quite limited and sometimes very, very limiting and imprisoning for the person who's using the language. So I had the thought <clears throat> about this language, racist, anti-racist that it's probably similar, it's diagnostic thinking. And uh, last, last week, someone asked the great question of Walter Smith. Um, Walter, how can you be neutral about racism? Aren't you either a racist or an anti-racist? And his answer was so interesting. He said, I don't think so. And he said that he shared that they did a survey um, that tests racist attitudes in his large organization that he worked in there in Pittsburgh. And that the groups that had more African American staff actually rated a little higher on racism. He shared that right after that question came in. And I'm finding, and you're gonna see this in the quotes I'm gonna share from Walter, that this idea of systemic racism is me to me moving towards a systems view something beyond the symptom how do you get beyond the symptom i suspect that in many dialogues in people's heads and between people this language racist anti-racist works against a better understanding of what's really going on so um, i'm going to invite you to share comments or questions about what i'm sharing after the breakout section and if you want to go ahead and chat them in while I'm talking, go for it. So here's one of those Zen koans from, Rod, uh, from Walter. Something bigger than what happens inside people. And then there's this one, I'll read it. Race is not real. Race is a social construct and it does not exist. We made it up, invented by Dutch and Portuguese explorers in the 13th and 14th centuries as they began to roam around the world. The social anxiety that is an aspect of racism operates when there are only white people in a room, meeting, organization, or state. Racism is another form of human violence. We're a highly aggressive species living on a highly aggressive planet. The virus isn't out to get us. We eat each other, sometimes with barbecue sauce, sometimes rare with just a little pepper. Every human social group has a hierarchy and a system of rank that justifies and normalizes aggression. 
Some of these, I'm just gonna let them sit there and they'll be on the video for you to look at and contemplate. I checked all these quotes out with, Rog, uh, with Walter. Third time in a row, I've mistaken called him Roger. I've never called Walter Smith Roger before in my life. And three times now, when I'm doing this webinar, I do it. Can somebody please explain this to me? So let me talk now about racism and the projection process, the family projection process. Again, Walter emphasized this. We've all, those of you who've been around Bowen theory a long time know that Bowen made a link between these things. And I said to Walter uh, during the call, can we pause and define this? And we did, he did a little bit and he mentioned the triangle. So if we have time, I'm going to touch on these two aspects of the eight concepts in Bowen theory, the ones in yellow, the family projection process and the societal emotional process, and try to look at them in terms of race. And you can see the bottom, I put symbiosis, the foundational differentiation of self. The family projection process runs on symbiosis. So I created this diagram um, to try to lay out the foundational ideas of the family projection process. So bear with me, this is three or four minutes, simple, basic theory. But let's please join me in considering this concept in terms of racism. So, it starts with the idea of an anxious perceptual field, chronic anxiety, represented by this red large oval. What I was thinking was that um, chronic anxiety, one feature of the human experience, not the only uh, feature, we also have a chronic nobility. But this chronic anxiety, which is fear, of what doesn't exist, a tremendous capacity to fear what doesn't exist. It's omnipresent within this group of four people and really within humans, just like water. So water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen and oxygen are everywhere. They're everywhere throughout the entire atmosphere of the earth and actually beyond the atmosphere of the earth. But this hydrogen and oxygen combine to form water and they, they pool in places. Chronic anxiety does this too. It pools in places. It gathers itself into the stream in our backyard and runs along towards a lake, like Lake Champlain nearby here. So chronic anxiety pools in a like fashion within groups. Is chronic anxiety pooling in the African-American community in America? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? So here's how this pooling happens in Bowen theory. So now we have two parents, the male on the left, the square, the female on the right, the circle, and two offspring, a daughter and a son. And I'm just depicting, now we're switching lenses that H2O of chronic anxiety is still everywhere, but now let's think of it as a certain, um, these two individuals are kind of like receptors for this field, the parents. So they've got this stuff. And the daughter gets born and their son gets born. And Bowen theory identifies a specific pathway via which the anxiety that they are receptors for is transferred into one of the individuals. And think along with me, is this the way it happens with racism? Is this what happens with minority groups like um, Jews in, in the 30s in Germany and Western Europe and African Americans here in the US or other minority groups here? here? So something threatens this underlying chronic anxiety, something stimulates it. Could be a problem in the marriage, for example. Noticing that she's paying less attention to me because she pays more attention to the children now, and that feels threatening to me. So now this father feels threatened, 
and the daughter responds to his threat. That little hopping of the, of the circle was her responding to his threat because she's undifferentiated from him. She's so connected. She can tell what his eyes, from his eyes, whether he feels threatened or not. Um, we have a problem here, which is that I am now looking at Mark Abrams' screen, and I don't know if you all are as well. Um, yes, Ellen Rogan, I can see your face. Thank you. So Mark Abrams, if you're on the call, could you stop sharing your screen? And Roz, if you could help me possibly. Okay, here we go. I can do that. Okay, I'm going to go back into my screen now. So remember the hop, she's responding. Then what happens is he notices this response to his chronic anxiety. He notices it and he begins to focus on it. So just playing with race for a bit here, we have chronically anxious Americans. They feel threatened. Maybe they walk into a room and or a, a black man pulls up in a truck in front of their house and they, their chronic anxiety is activated. Underneath awareness, they react. And he sees the black man who steps out of the car who's there to pick up a t-shirt for his daughter for school. He sees that reaction and he responds. Now some of this chronic anxiety is pooling in him the way it could pool in a kid. And notice that now the other group members have turned to orange. So this is the basic idea of the family projection process that the chronic anxiety is now pooled in one individual and the others are benefiting. They have a little bit lower level of chronic anxiety because of this phenomenon. So I think this is an interesting to think, idea to think about, that this is a way to think about why is it that we have this um, troubling pattern of African Americans um, having such a disproportionate amount of the wealth in the US and um, committing a disproportionate number of the crimes and having much worse health outcomes during COVID-19, that the chronic anxiety is pooling in some of the members of that group, too many of the members of that group, and that in some ways we're benefiting from this. Of course, we also suffer from it, just like this family does who now has a daughter who has a very troubling symptom that they're all worried about. I don't think this is simple. In fact, I'm professionally skeptical about this family projection process. How much of the symptoms in the children we know is accounted for by this? I don't think it's 100%. How much of the problems in our African-American neighbors is accounted for by this? Maybe it's, maybe it's a higher number than with children. I don't know. I don't think we know. The science isn't in, but it's an important thing to think about. This projection process occurs via variations of too much, lots of different kinds of too much. Anxious protection, anxious direction, like that lecture, the anxious lecture. Anxious criticism, violence. Anxious othering. Anxious praise, nurturing, and patience. So I'm puzzling to myself, is th are those all ways in which racial bias travels. Maybe my kind of anxiously praising Walter at the beginning of the webinar last uh, week was a form of racism. Just because of time, I'm going to skip this awesome thing here and get into this. What Walter says here, while child abuse injures children, it stabilizes family relationships. which is really making the same point I just went through. And uh, 
this very simple but powerful idea that the great difficulty, the most important block to observing human behavior has been the difficulty in seeing the part oneself plays in the functioning of others. So I'm on a journey to try to understand what is the part that I play in this um, troubles that occur within my neighbors. And Walter put something in here that it must be hard. It must be tough for you to see your part in the process of systemic racism. It's harder for white people, which I thought was very interesting. Just like he said, it's harder if you have an abusive parent and an abused kid, the bystander parent, it's harder for them to see their part in the process than the other two. So curiosity, a tried and true tool of differentiation of self. Um, I am curious about Walter's experience. And he told me these things, a common issue that arises in issues of race in African Americans. They point out the discrimination and some whites reply that the issue is not about race, but something else. Of course, there's not a right or correct perception of reality. The subjective experience of many African Americans is that their experience is not seen, validated and visible. Very interesting. I'm trying to see into that and not, not just jump to say, well, why don't you take responsibility for that and think about it more, not knee jerk. I don't wanna do Bowen theory knee jerk on this one. In a family or society, Walter says, the more mature interaction is each person having curiosity and interest in the point of view of others without agreeing or disagreeing, but simply understanding that others experience the world differently. That feels like a pretty good mantra for me to keep using in 2020. A family or social system, Walter goes on, that reflects chronic anxiety has polarized relationships rooted in cutoff and differences in perception becoming threatening. Um, those, no, those differences, excuse me, in perception become threatening rather than simply varying perceptions and experiences. I think I could do a lot better on this last sentence. What's it like to be you? I asked Walter this and he responded this way. The coronavirus may give white people insight to the chronic anxiety of being black in America. With the virus, I'm constantly aware who's around me, who's wearing a mask, where I sit in a room to be safe. Is the person approaching me to ask a question safe? In a new environment, how do I keep myself safe? This is every day for most African Americans. I've never entered a restaurant, conference room, meeting, store without scanning the environment to determine if my race makes, makes me unsafe at risk for discrimination. After 63 years of scanning, it's normalized and routine. He goes on, many whites think racism is the overt acts. I do not. And that to me connects back to this idea that racist is individual thinking and may be part of the problem, that diagnostic thinking. The most prevalent acts of racism, Roger uh, Walter wrote to me, include being invisible, not acknowledged and ignored, subtle blaming, subtle, it's the subtle blaming, being isolated and segregated, Subtle reactivity when you walk into a room. Who can't relate to that? That something changes in Vermont in a conference room when everyone there is white and a black man or a black person walks in the room. Something subtle. That's something subtle like the H2O. That's what I'm thinking about. That, that's what I'm thinking is this thing, systemic racism that I don't really understand yet. Being someone's best black friend just knowing you, you have to be, uh, what he meant there, the last one's a little convoluted, but it means you have to be twice as good to get in the door. Okay, so that's my section on family, 
projection process and racism. And I have a section now on um, societal emotional process view of racism. And I think what I want to do is pause here and I'm going to present this after our breakout. So we have 52 participants on this meeting. I'm so glad you're here with us. And I'm going to use the Zoom tool to set you up into groups of three, two, three, four. And I'm going to give you some minutes, uh, probably like nine minutes. When this starts, if you look at your watch, you'll have a sense of when it's winding down. I like doing this and I've been asking advisors whether this is working and I keep getting the answer, yes, this is working. And the thing that I think is um, people benefit from an opportunity to take a pause and try to integrate and to think out loud and talk about what they're thinking. So I wanna provide that opportunity for you. And I also wanna share some thoughts about how to do this really well. Um, I got to click through my slides to get there. Hold on a sec. Bear with me. <clears throat> Here's my suggestion about how to approach this conversation. First, skip the introductions. It's not going to have a lot of time. It's really not about making new friends. It's an opportunity to think. Experiment with saying what you really think. If you're lucky, you won't know anybody in this meeting, in your breakout, and you could actually try out what does it sound like to say what you really think in a responsible fashion. Listen to what they really think. If you can pull off the second and third in these bullets, it'll be an extraordinary 10 minutes. Doesn't happen all that much about racism. Practicing curiosity. And I suggest you skip the debate. One way to do that is really not even to respond. Just let someone speak and then take your turn and let them speak and listen and then let a third person speak. All right, I am going to set these breakup rooms, uh, set up these breakup room, these breakout rooms now. You bear with me, it'll take just a minute and you'll spontaneously find yourself in a room with some of the other people on the call. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. And there'll be a countdown meter for you, uh, letting you know when there's a, um, a minute to go. And this will be a nine minute breakout conversation. All right, talk to you in a bit. If, um, if anybody has a question or a comment that you'd like to share via chat, I'm curious how the breakout rooms went and what thoughts got stimulated for you. What did you notice? If you could just take a minute to um, type that in via chat. Uh, you could try raising your hand and I might be able to get you uh, onto the screen here, but I can't promise because I can't see everybody. I'm just waiting to see if something comes in here by chat. Some of you may have heard that Walter Smith was going to be on this call. And um, sorry about that. That was a, a mistake by one of our partners who put that, put that information out there. He's here in his quotes, but uh, he'll be back in September. Um, Great to have a chance to think out loud about this, says somebody. Good, that's good. 
I think for me, one of the practices is just to have more conversations. Um, I have a lot of things I focus on. There's a lot of problems in the world and lots of things I put my attention on and spend my days trying to make things better, like I'm sure all of you do. And uh, <clears throat> I haven't put enough attention on this topic. So I'm going to do more of that. Somebody says it was healing. Wow. How about that? I wonder how you think about these well-differentiated figure, figures. Perhaps they're referring to like Martin Luther King in terms of the systems they were in, family and otherwise. As Walter said, there's so much I don't know. I, I can't tell you. I don't know the answer to that. Except to say that it makes sense to me that consciousness is shaped by social processes. So the way people are, the way people think, is powerfully shaped by social processes, usually a lot of it outside of their awareness. And the family is the foundational social process in society. We literally physically get born into the family. So the other structures, the other levels of society, the teams, the groups, the schools, the towns, the states, the nations, on and on, the clubs, um, they all can learn a lot from examining the processes that go on in families because they're so fundamental to humans. Someone said something about the relief as a white person to not have the chronic anxiety focused on me and that that's really sad. That's interesting. That probably this relief is outside of awareness a lot of times <clears throat> that we feel. And there, there may be a place where that projection process where we're benefiting is hidden from view. Somebody wrote that it, this, they appreciate the fact that having a dialogue about race that's not reactive is unusual. And that often the norm when in a dialogue with others about race is, is a lot of intensity. It's not a calm conversation. Among my favorite things about Walter Smith's presentation last week, I watched it again, was just how calm he was. And um, just, just hearing him put out very powerful, provocative, even challenging ideas. But as he said, he did such hard work to get calm about child abuse. And um, you can just feel it in his presence when he's talking about race. So what a treasure. So thank you for those comments. I'm going to launch into another seven minutes of presentation here and talk some more about the family projection or societal emotional process. But just before I do that, I want to, um, I'm trying to get my, uh, my uh, share my screen. Um, I wanna just tell you what's coming up here in this stuck together, stuck apart um, series where we try to explore the challenge of being free together and free apart. So um, the Vermont Center for Family Studies has a training program. Just want you to know about that. You can learn more about it. And also just to comment that if you are appreciating these meetings, we operate them on a shoestring. I am not getting paid as the executive director of the organization. And there's a ton of volunteer energy that goes into making this happen, but it isn't free. And we do appreciate donations. If you feel moved to do it, that's easy to do on our new website. And uh, in three weeks, we'll have a presentation on neuroscience and prejudice, July 9th with Dr. Fred Travis. Dr. Travis is somebody we've gotten to know. He's been a speaker at the Meditation and Family Health Conference that I've organized the last two years, which I'm changing the name of this year. 
I keep changing the name to Inner Silence and Healthy Separation, Exploring the Relationship Between Differentiation, Transcendence, and Mindfulness. And Dr. Travis is a very um, distinguished neuroscientist, lots of publications, NIH grants, 30-year career, particularly interested in um, the topic of uh, sustainable eudaimonic happiness, a neuroscience of sustainable happiness. And he also uh, has a lot to say about a lot of things, and he has something to share about prejudice. And then we have some other meetings coming up. These will all be posted on our website. You can see them here. We're not going to do this every week during the summer. In Vermont, we have to treasure our summers when we get to thaw out. <clears throat> um, so I'm going to share with you now some thoughts about the family about this uh, societal emotional process view of racism. And so again, putting that concept in the context of the eight concepts of Bowen theory, I put it up there on the top because I feel like it sort of is an attempt to take all these other seven that speak specifically about family process and apply it to the wider social situation. Certainly a fertile ground for those who want to understand a Bowman theory of racism. So I'm going to start with a little quiz. A little, that's not a quiz. It's just check, test your perception here. So I have the facts and I'm going to present them in a sec, but I want you to just take a second and scratch a number down on a piece of paper or just do it in your head to these uh, five questions. Just make a guess. How many total Americans are they? How many are killed a year? All Americans. How many of those are done by police? What percentage of those are African American and what percentage of those are criminal acts? So I like to dig in and find facts. It helps me understand reality. I try to stay in touch with reality and touch with facts. I find the public dialogue and places like Facebook and um, all around me often are very, very distorting of facts. The facts don't mean racism doesn't exist. And here they are. How many total Americans? 325 million. 12,000 of those Americans are killed every year. That was 2019. What's really interesting to me is that I believe it is absolute solid fact that that number is going down. The per capita number of killings that are happening in America is going down. And I say it's fascinating. One of the fascinating things about that to me is that so many people are not aware of it. The percentage of those that are police killings is 1,000. It's kind of interesting, one out of every 12. And what percentage of those are African Americans? 35%, 45% is white. And then there's other minority groups. This is a, a very badly disproportionate share of African Americans that are killed in these police killings. What percentage of these are criminals? I don't know the answer to that. One researcher said that 95% of the police killings occur when there's an active assault happening, either the police or someone else being assaulted. And I think that's our squishy, how do you define that? Something I don't know a lot about. So I would love to know if anyone in the group underestimated the number of people who were killed per year, Americans. Um, if you could share that by chat, if, you're, if you care to. I think most of us live in a perceptual field. Walt, Walter speaks to this in our email exchange, that rates of violence in America have never been lower but Walter asserts our fear of violence has never been higher. That is absolutely amazing to me. And he goes on to say, <clears throat> the gap between facts and emotion is a general indicator of levels of chronic anxiety. 
So if you have anxiety pooling in one group in a family, that person or that group will have a wider gap between facts and emotion. <clears throat> over long periods of time. Our fear of violence is high and it has been sustained for decades. In social groups with high levels of fusion, fear cycles within the relationship network escalating based on the reactivity of others and self in the reciprocal processes of relationships and not facts. It's very painful for me to think about the degree to which we're all caught and so easily caught in a cycling network of fearful thinking. And a big influence on my thinking about this has been Dr. Steven Pinker. Came to my attention in 2016 when Pope Francis came to Philadelphia and declared, as we all know, the world is getting increasingly violent. The wonderful Pope Francis said. The next day in the USA Today, Dr. Steven Pinker, Harvard linguist, who, and author of this book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, Why Violence is Declining, or Has Declined, Why Violence Has Declined, not if it's declined, but why it's declined. It's a thick book, 600 pages, very scholarly, fact-based. He's not an ideologue. He's not a Republican. Dr. Stephen Perk Pinker wrote an op-ed in USA Today. You can still read it. He said, world violence is declining. He has a second book out now, Enlightenment Now, which is it's talking about the philosophical enlightenment of the 1800s and the case for reason, science, humanism, and progress. In this book, there's 16 chapters that cover wealth, global wealth, global health, the environment, lots of different topics, topics. And he presents data that shows that humans continue to evolve and we're doing pretty well. For example, this chart is in uh, the first book. very dramatic declines in violence over hundreds of years. Pinker documents this. <clears throat> and it doesn't stop. Take a look at rape from 1970 to 2008. So this is percentage of the 1973 level, 100% there in 1973 on the left. And slowly but steadily going down. Sociologists call this phenomenon rape and other things, the great crime decline. Some of you may have heard about the dramatic decline in crime in New York City. It's all across the world. It's all across, across Western Europe. I think we live in a, in a contagion of anxiety and fear and that African Americans experience more of that. And that's not a good thing. And I don't know exactly what to do about it. <clears throat> they're not only contagious, but they're also part of the relationship system, writes Walter, and not merely each person. So for me to think I'm outside of racism, that doesn't fit with Walter saying what Walter's saying, just because I think I'm a good person and treat African Americans and other minorities with respect, that doesn't mean I'm outside of it. The fear becomes attached to skin color, neighborhoods, other characteristics, and when activated, shapes perception, decision-making, and behavior. It becomes a functional fact when confirmed by others' similar reality or similar reactivity. It seems accurate to me that this is a functional fact for African Americans, that the world is dangerous. I think it's all Americans, but it's worse for African Americans on the, for the most part. And um, it's a sad thing that we're so afraid. The real dangers at home, vast majority of people injured or killed are, are killed at home. So Walter says, if you wanna be safe, go to an African American and walk around, but get the hell out of your house. Gonna close now um, on one final quote from Walter. Thank you for joining us and uh, hope you'll come back on uh, July 9th to hear Dr. Travis talk about the neuroscience of prejudice. Walter's uh, final comment here, which is 
something in the direction of my eye position. Vermont is a perfect place to work at the basic emotional processes in human violence. One just has to see all of the violence in humans that has been normalized. It's all around you. And with that, we will conclude today's version of Stuck Together, Stuck Apart. And I hope you have a good week.